Hello YouTube, hello everyone, and welcome to an anti-Oscars special to counterpoint uh, last week's episode of London After Midnight. Uh, now first, a quick uh, recap of last week's Oscar special. Uh, turns out some Oscar voters admitted to voting for 12 Years a Slave without actually watching it. The well-behaved Mormon woman is not alone in her condemnation of the satanic lesbian propaganda that is Disney's Wicked, <coughs> I mean Frozen. And guess what? Women are still drastically underrepresented in films, along with ethnic minorities, to the point that if you are at the movies, you are more likely to see an extraterrestrial or fantastical being than you are to see an Asian woman. In any case, um, I shall open up the floor for people to um, introduce themselves. And, uh, hang on, I'd better make sure that we're going alphabetically. So, uh, Koki Pirate, hello. Howdy ho. Ah, okay. Um, and Schizophrenic Queen? No, <laughs> sorry, I meant Pingay Music, sorry. <laughs> oh, actually, first, first comer, Pingay Music. You are, you're, um, what are you? I uh, don't know if you're a first-time listener, but you're a first-time guest, so why don't you introduce yourself and tell us something about yourself. Oh, that's all. Uh, Ping, mm-hmm. uh, Ping called you one, and then my name is Johan, and I'm a musician from Sweden, and... Yeah, I'm like it here. <laughs> That's Yay! <a> hero. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, now I've learned my ABC um, series regular, but first time in a few weeks. Schizophrenic Queen. Wee hi. <laughs> and uh, on the, uh, your second appearance, you James, nineteen seventy-eight. Hello there. This is James S. Croft, you James, nineteen seventy-eight. I must be psychic, because I kind of knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't say it, people riot. So. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, before we begin our, uh, well, the anti-Oscars, as, as we've dubbed them, um, is anybody, I'm just going to open up the floor, not even go in a circle. Um, uh, that there are actually Oscar voters who will vote for a film like 12 Years a Slave, but not watch it, claiming it's quote-unquote too upsetting. Um, but this is a film where the posters always said from day one, Oscar nominated, um, but they don't necessarily watch the films. Um, thoughts? Uh, first of all, that explains how Jared Leto won the Oscar for Best Supporting <laughs> Actor. The only possible way anyone could vote for him would be if they hadn't seen the fucking film. Um, but unfortunately, though, uh, with regard to 12 Years a Slave specifically, as much as it disgusts me, this validates uh, Rush Limbaugh's point that uh, the Academy only uh, voted 12 Years a Slave Best Picture because it had Slave in the title. As I said Mm. during last week's show, uh, this year's Oscar ceremony should have carried the subtitle, Look at us, aren't we so progressive? Mm. So it was, oh, this, this... Voting for this film will make me look good and make the Academy look good. Mm. That's, and, oh yes, voting for Jared Leto, who I haven't seen in this film, will make me look as if I'm pro-LGBT mm. rights. And Ellen's really popular right now, and feminism is, an is, is, a, is a current issue, is fashionable, is in... And um, what else was it? Oh, yes, Frozen is the only animated film I've seen. That was another. (laughs) People people admitting that they only voted for Frozen because they hadn't watched any of the other nominated films. Yes, and and they're all a bunch of old men who don't normally watch that kind of thing. And also, I I do have a theory, James. I think you and I are the only people who have actually seen Dallas Buyers (laughs) Club. Except Certainly one. So, oh right, yes, but um, I don't. I don't think Bun watched it all the way through. I think it just ended up with uh, destroying the television or whatever. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know how we managed to to survive the whole two hour nightmare. Uh, you survived but... it through alcohol. I survived <laughs> it through sheer force of will and having survived in Hedok. Are you a Jedi? To have I think those kind it is of like... powers. <laughs> no, no. If you can, basically, if you can survive Kim Ki Dook, you can survive anything. <laughs> uh-huh. I think it is like me on a movie. I'm like, I can't walk out on a movie. 
I cannot. Uh. I just have to say, I was on uh, the movie, uh, ah, whatever, Lost or whatever. The, everybody talked about it and everybody said it was the best movie ever. And I was like, looked at the movie and half of the movie I was like, it's itching all over my body. It was like, I have to go, but I cannot because I don't walk away from movies. <laughs> Do you mean like, cast? Do you mean Castaway, where Tom Hanks is on an island and nothing happens for two hours? No, actually not. That 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 movie probably is a better movie than, than this one. <laughs> but, okay. Does anybody else have anything to add to uh, to what you James said? You know, I can't help but wonder, like, um, because you do have this sort of venue to communicate a message, and I suppose. The question is, when you're trusted that kind of role, would you say that you're obligated to view the merits of art as art, as opposed to use this venue to highlight certain social issues or mm. bring up, um, you know, try to otherwise communicate some message, um, message that you think is I, I progressive think term, or good? I think the term you're looking for, Koki, is score points. Because, yeah, um, I, as much as I wish the Oscars or any other film, uh, any other award ceremony had anything to do with the art itself, especially when it's something like Hollywood, I think it's, um, I think it's the best kept secret. It, it's it's the best kept secret that everyone knows in Tinseltown that yes, the Oscars is ninety nine percent. 99% politics and social issues and mm. backstage bargaining. You know, I don't think there's ever been um, a bribery scandal at the Oscars, but it, it's all about the political manoeuvring, who has an Oscar, who hasn't, which film is more popular, which film will get the best press, the best mm. reaction if they vote for it. As I say, Dallas Buyers Club is absolute shit. This this is, you know, um, Alex a actually pointed out, nobody's come, come out and admitted that uh, they voted for Jared Leto in Dallas Buyers Club without watching it. Well, we have solid evidence that they didn't watch the film. The fact that they didn't stone Jared, Jared Leto to death <laughs> instead of giving him an award. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, but I think the Oscars is uh, the thing to make you you make its big show to make Hollywood glamorous, and then you take the bad movies and make uh, people look feel like I, I'm good, I'm happy, I'm a yes, good it, actress. It's self-indulgence in some way and then you can make movies in the underground of a Hollywood that actually are good movies Absolutely <laughs> the idea that the best film voted for in the Oscars is the best film has been a joke for so long so yeah. basic, it's not, it's not a question of saving the Oscars it's not a question of getting the members to actually watch the films that they vote for or to uh, actually vote on the artistic merits of the film, not the social. But I impact, want to ask but... a statue on my toilet, so if I can get one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you can buy a plastic one somewhere. Yeah. I think it is just oh. a question. It, it is just a question of admitting that any award ceremony, any kind of um, competition, any kind of contest like this, where people decide is uh, always going to be personal opinion or groupthink. Uh, uh, people say that 12 Years a Slave is uh, an absolutely incredible, powerful, uh, well-made movie about an uh, important part of American history, so I'll just vote for it, even without watching it, because I, d I don't want to be left out. <laughs> Okay, and I would now like to talk um, about Frozen, mm -hmm. because I want to point something out here. What's happened, if you actually read up on this, is that um, because the Boy Scouts of America won't stop being homophobic assholes, uh, Disney, who provides something like $5 million a year to children's charities, um, 
no longer want to have anything to do with the scouts and they can invest elsewhere to basically clean up your homophobia or you don't get any money, any funding from us, you don't, you don't get our um, sort of, uh, what's the word, corporation anymore. This is outraged the religious right and they're actually now trying to claim um, that Frozen, not only apart from being satanic, is trying to recruit children into being gay. Even asking the rhetorical question, do you think parents take their children to the, to the movie Frozen, thinking let's get them indoctrinated to homosexuality early? Funnily enough, my answer to that question is no, I don't think any parents are thinking that. Uh, or if they are, they're as insane as you are. Um, now, Frozen is based on the story of the Ice Queen by Hans Christian Andersen, who in real life was actually gay. Um, he wrote uh, what are in fact originally intended to be gay parables. The Ugly Duckling, for example, is a gay parable. If you think about it, it could relate to all sorts of things. But personally to him, you know, being homosexual, growing up, knowing you're gay in a culture that doesn't accept it, you think you're this ugly duckling, you grew up to be a beautiful swan. When he realised that his love for another man couldn't be requited, he wrote about this symbolically with a story you may have heard of called The Little Mermaid which Disney made into a movie in 1989, but no one cared then. And now the Christian right are complaining, and they haven't even done enough research to point out that, yes, these stories, because gay writers rock, let's face it, were written by a gay man. Um, so does anybody have any sort of thoughts on the Christian right, the Boy Scouts, and the satanic lesbian propaganda that is Disney's Frozen? Only the fact that, uh, yes, as you say, this all revolves around the spats between the Christian right and uh, Disney. It's got mm. nothing to do with um, the actual film itself. Having now finally watched it, it is just <laughs> another Disney princess movie. It's exactly the same formula. If this is uh, promoting lesbianism, then The Lion <laughs> King was <laughs> that was promoting racism. What the fuck? Um, but at the I, end... I, of the uh, can I, I think just, I shouldn't... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Can go I ahead. just finish my point quickly because we are reaching the 15-minute limits? Uh, basically, uh, Disney refuses to, now refuses to give $5 million a year to the Scouts, so the Christian right have turned around and said, OK, Disney, we're going to deny you $5 million in ticket sales. That's it. The, just slapping the label of lesbian propaganda or satanic on it, the Christian right foot soldiers who actually listen to these uh, propaganda mongers, these fear mongers, they, they will boycott whatever uh, their pastors, their preachers, their radio hosts tell them to boycott. So uh, this is a lesbian movie. Uh, th this is lesbian <laughs> propaganda. They won't go to see it. So, again, as I say, uh, you refuse to give money to the Scouts, so we'll deny you that money. Um, and we'll get donations from, uh, we'll get donations by fear mongering, just like we always do. And uh, mm. it works in reverse as well. Uh, Chick fil A uh, gave money to. Um, Prote uh, marriage protection in inverted <laughs> commas organizations so just uh, tell the brainless creatards to go out and uh, buy chick-fil-a and they do so by the thousands mm. i wrote swedish good thing with this in sweden boy scouts and girl scouts are together and the th poor the only thing with they they are take care of nature uh, throw nature thing on each other and uh, make knots and have a nice time in a tent. Yeah. <laughs> that is a scout. Have a nice time in a tent? Oh, I say. <laughs> okay, and Koki? Yeah, I was just going to say that um not sure the whole lesbian propaganda thing, it seemed like just sort of a sisterly love. I think that lesbians' mm. powers of invisibility remain intact because it was a <laughs> male gay couple. Just to bring... Aha. Uh -huh. Well, yes, yes. Um, although you can blink and miss them. <laughs> um, 
But, uh, yes, well, uh, what can I say? I mean, uh, if there were a satanic lesbian Disney film, I would fucking love it. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, but, Jen wanted to watch Frozen just because it was condemned as lesbian propaganda. <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh, anything that pisses off the Christian right in America um, must must be worth a oh, but look. And I must, getting yeah. back to my point, though, that it's just a, a, it's just a right-wing funny boycott, it's going to backfire because, like Jen, millions more people are going to watch it precisely because of the controversy. The only bad publicity is no publicity. Uh, yeah, and I recommend anybody listening, go out and buy as many copies of the DVD as you can afford. <laughs> <laughs> ah, so, uh, does anybody else have any um, thoughts on that topic? I don't think so. Let okay, it go. Please. <laughs> let it go. I I agree. We'll we'll let we'll let it go. So uh, we are waiting on Queenie to come back with a drink. But the other topic is an article which will be linked in the description. Uh, that yes, guess what? Uh, women are still drastically underrepresented in films, along with people of ethnic minorities. We kind of touched upon it this time. I'm a little bit shocked that you're more likely to see an alien or a mythical or fantastical being than you are to see an Asian woman. Um, and um, I suppose we did cover quite a lot to do with um, visibility and casting um, last week. But again, it's one of those things that really surprises me. I wouldn't have thought, at least, that women generally were particularly underestimated as, well, I think they specified uh, actual protagonists or at least characters with names and dialogue. Maybe it depends a bit on the genre, but... um, I honestly think you see... Uh, oh, and welcome back, Queenie. Do, do you have an opinion on to either of the past two topics? What, uh, Frozen or...? Um, if you have something to say about Frozen, etc., go ahead. Uh, or if you want to move straight on to the topic of women being underrepresented in films, you can go straight there if you wish. Oh, uh, uh, I didn't have anything prepared. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I do think women are underrepresented... I mean, yeah. a lot of the times in in media and other things, uh, it's I, I guess they're more of an accessory th- than their own sort of character. You could say. I wouldn't say it's one hundred percent thing or that it happens all the time, but I mean, it happens enough that you can notice it. Yeah, I mean, I would say actually the last I suppose actually the last two new films I've seen were Frozen mainly about women, and before that, um, a film starring um, Karen Gillan, uh, where she is the central character and drives the story, and obviously, uh, and you could argue that there's a man who is the object of desire in that story, but it mainly focuses on a writer with writer's block, who's Karen Gillan. So maybe I just don't watch those kinds of films. Maybe, Maybe I'm very select that I happen not to see the sorts of films where women are uh, left out or, or really marginalised them. Um, I don't know. Anybody else have any input? Uh, focusing specifically on the fact that you are more likely to see an extraterrestrial or fantastic character, magical character, fairy or something like that, than a Asian woman, specifically an Asian woman. Uh, mm. Yes, again, that's not really a problem with the sort of films that I watch, but uh, to flip that on mm. its head, you're not likely to see a um, Caucasian character in those films unless it's the stereotypical American businessman. <laughs> but yes, uh, re- re- regarding the whole issue of the portrayal of women in general, that mm. the fact that uh, women are still um, I c- that women in films are still eye candy antagonists. Um, that they're, they're still uh, they're still the token woman character. In so many cases, uh, we've discussed the Bechdel test, how it doesn't mm. apply in so many situations. Mm. to so many films, but... Uh... 
there? It is an interest. It is a, a, a measure. It is a guide to point out that yes, most films, even in the twenty first century, are men doing manly things That's in order to help. get the girl. <laughs> so I think. I- but, but the th- whole thing is that it is a, like a historical thing because we still are doing the movies from the uh, big artists from the many years ago and they they were male uh, and and it is going to take about 25 to say 60 years or whatever to make women's literature the, the literature they make the books yeah. the movie scripts and so on because if i would write a character I would write a character that I know, and I know me, and I happens to be male. So for me, it's hard to think like a woman, not because I cannot imagine, but I write from what I know. So oh, it is okay. like, okay, 60 years ago, in ago, sorry, 60 years, from 25 years from now, or 60 years from now, then we probably, if this evaluation, blah, 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 we'll go through, we'll have many more great roles for women and so on, I think. Thank you, Pinge. That is an excellent way of looking at it. The idea that uh, movies are reactionary, that we are still, that movies today are still responding to uh, the television, the literature, the films of 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, yes, they talk about today how the how the film industry, how Hollywood has been taken over by the quote-unquote geeks and the nerds, the people who are making the films that they wanted to see as children. They grew up watching Star Wars So now uh, making a Star Wars reboot. They grew up watching Transformers, so now they're making Transformers. They grew up Mm. watching Star Trek, so now they're making Star Trek. And in every single case, they're utterly slaughtering it. (laughs) They are (laughs) bastardizing it beyond description. But yes, Pinge, I think you hit the nail right on the head there. That in 25, 30 years the girls and uh, more progressive boys and uh, transgender, gender-neutral individuals who are growing up today will be creating their own art and reflecting Mm. the society that they want to see. Mm. So uh, uh, there's there's always that kind of time lag. (laughs) (laughs) Sadly. You can see the whole... Everyone's a generation behind, um, <laughs> you know, the politicians. <laughs> Most church leaders are some several centuries behind. But <laughs> in regards to Alex's original statement of there being, um, you're being more likely to find an extraterrestrial or some kind of supernatural character um, as opposed to an Asian woman, to play the devil's advocate, Given the scope and scale of the universe, aliens are severely (laughs) underrepresented. (laughs) (laughs) But (laughs) seriously, though, um, I think that um, even though I guess it's not quite on the topic, I'm thinking specifically historical films, there's like a whole lot of history that a lot of woman history that one, we don't really hear about because it's just been lost to time. But two, people don't seem to care about. I mean, how many movies are there about wars? And I can't think of a single movie about, say, a young woman in the Middle Ages who was thrown into a nunnery by her parents trying to escape and everyone accusing her of demons being inside her. That's an interesting storyline. It's historically relevant. But we only pay attention to the male side of history a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I think that when we start to, I guess it goes into like when we, the way we look at history, the way we tell history will also go into inspire our, our art and um, what kind of stuff art will focus on. And also that's, and also that history is written by they that won. And they are not written by they that actually, Yes. Get burned by 
being a witch uh, and so on. They are written by the one that burned the bit, burned the witch. <laughs> yes, that that's absolutely true. Um, which br- brings me back to the point I was going to make. Um, if it, when we see a extraterrestrial or angel or fairy or other kind of supernatural being in a film, that, yeah, the role is clear. We know why they're there. They have been written with a specific role in mind. When we see an Asian woman in a film, what is her purpose except to be the Asian woman? And this goes back to what I said before. Um, it's a Korean film. What is the purpose of having a white man except, oh, he's the American? <laughs> Obviously. And as again, it's a, it's a question of... It, it, it's. It's not that writers or historians are limited. Remember, uh, Hollywood only makes what people will pay to see. And when we do look at history through male, we do look at history through white male eyes. Um, you know, uh, Black History Month, Woman's History Month. Where's the white male history month? Uh, we don't need a month. You want to read the white male perspective and interpretation of history? It's every history book ever written. It's every college history course ever taught. So, um, yeah. What, we can, oh, we can see a similar... Uh, sorry, we can see a similar thing in Scandinavia. It's like uh, Nor- Norway doing very great f- films in uh, many genders, but in Sweden we don't see them. Mm. And we have the same culture. We are the same. We are like there's no difference between Norway and Sweden. It's more mm. a border that some stupid fuck wrote a couple of years ago. And it's like an airtight thing between Norwegian film and Swedish film. So it, <laughs> it's like. What what isn't uh, between Asian and and US? It's like, whoa, there's a long border. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. thinking about what um you James said, um, do you think that aliens become kind of token? They're misrepresented and they're not really. You know, you don't uh, really hear their part of view in history. You don't really hear about the aliens that are trying to bring stability to Earth. You only hear about the humans fighting off alien invaders, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. almost as yeah, it's almost as if the aliens themselves are entirely fictional. And uh, the, make, the writers of the film <laughs> are creating them to fulfill a certain role as the personification I... of human fears. But you, you can ask be... the grey one that I have befi- beside me in the sofa. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're being an apologist there for these bigots because we get an entirely human-centric, Earth-centric view. Oh, I, I'm um, human-splaining. You're human... Yeah, yes, indeed. Stop. Quit your human-splaining. Um, exactly. Human I, 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 I <laughs> you think should. so. Uh, as I, I did see something recently about the um, the entire Earth owes so many billions. Uh, no, owes like a trillion dollars. Who the fuck do we owe it to? Jupiter. <laughs> so I think maybe add some other planet should explain their privilege because apparently we're we're in fucking debt to them. Okay, so um, our first film nomination to discuss is the student film Voices. Uh, where I will say that I liked the concept, I liked the way it was shot, a lot of the angles, Uh, I felt that there wasn't really enough time for the premise to breathe. Uh, And I'm guessing that because it's a student film, it was an assignment and it couldn't be longer than ten minutes. And that maybe the idea could have been held for if you were to make maybe a half-hour film or something, um, and another idea should have been used in its place. Um, Much of it, I would say, uh, any shortcoming for me, other than that, it's obvious that this is a student film, probably someone's first film, Um, and obviously you're not expecting the average teenager to be the best actor, Um, and uh, and I sort of thought, uh, other than an intriguing central premise, 
that I, uh, there was something I, I think quite experimental about the way it was shot, in that they technically, apart from um, when they use freehand, when I'm not, not quite sure if there was a stylistic reason for it, when it didn't look like they didn't need to, the, the fact that they technically did what we call crossing the line, which is uh, it's a way, it's very difficult to describe without drawing a diagram, but crossing the line is a way of uh, essentially changing between angles, but they're the wrong angles to change between. So you're technically breaking the rules, but the reason for the rule is it confuses the eye. <coughs> and most people wouldn't say that's crossed the line. Most people would go, what? Hang on. Because, because you know, there are, because th- there's a reason for the rules, but you can cross the line without actually confusing the eye, which they seem to have pulled off. So I'm going to guess that's a deliberate thing, along with the, the head-on shots, which you very rarely see. Well, the thing about your own amateur film or um, small indie film or student film is you can be deliberately experimental. So I think this was shot with some knowledge and some skill. I, don't, I think you'd know if, if those were blunders. Um, and the technical quality uh, was pretty impressive for, uh, I don't know if this was high school or college. Obviously, technology's come on since I was, oh God, when I was at school and college, the, particularly the editing equipment we had was so appalling. You know, but uh, we live in a more digital age now. Uh, the internet was new when I left school. Um, and uh, going alphabetically again, uh, Koki, your opinion of voices? Um, nothing. I, I just thought it'd be a cool reveal at the end if he shaves his head and becomes paralyzed to found the X- X-Men. Uh, but <laughs> I guess... I don't know. I, 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 I like the idea, like, you suddenly hear all of these different voices being overwhelmed or whatever. Um, mm. A fun little thought experiment is, um, what if there were no voices? What if he was just incredibly self-conscious for a day? And then comes mm. that realization, which, you know, so I guess there's still some room to play with, but um, at the end, they, they just sort of state, you know, what it was about, and... Mm. Um, there's that whole my girlfriend's into my best friend plotline that they just sort of left mm. in the air, but yeah. um, I, I liked um, you know, I, I guess I, I like the whole um sort of someone's looking at him and then he's imagining that she's thinking that he's following her because sometimes you might run into the same person twice as like oh mm. god does this person think I'm a total creeper you know so. Yeah. When I play around with the idea that this is all in his imagination, it, it's an interesting yeah. thought. I don't know if it was the um, uh, creator's intent. You, that, that, you've raised a kind of philosophical point there, because there, there's no epistemological way of determining whether he is uh, psychically hearing people's thoughts, or if this is all in his head. <laughs> yes, I suppose so. There, even, even if he was genuinely hearing voices, um, yeah, how would he know? Yeah, but mm. anyway, interesting idea. There's some room to play around with the idea. I, I wish it was a bit more open-ended, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it does also occur to me, a rather dark thought, and not wishing to offend Americans, but when you think of, uh, sorry to say this, but when you think of American high schools and colleges, you do sometimes think of, there's a possibility that somebody hearing that, those sorts of rather dark things, would go into school with a gun one day. <laughs> Apologies for the darkness, though. I'm not suggesting a killing spree ending or, or, or a bloodbath sequel. I'm just saying that that sort kind of occurs. Um, but, as we say, we don't. There, nobody could ever know, even if, the, the, if it were a true story, nobody could ever know. Maybe that's the, the Twilight Zone um, kind of factor there. Um, Pinge, your thoughts on voices? Yes, I'm a bit on the cookie, cookie thing there, where it's like, was it... Did he did he really hear someone else? For me, it was like my school years that I thought everybody said bad things about me. So, so I, for the, so for me, it was like shit. They are filming me now, but they, they, they did it in a good way, and and the the, the movie was like uh, explaining a thought in a good way, but. Was the thought that he really heard, or was the thought that that was what he thought everybody talked about him? So I was in the middle of and thought, 
I don't know. What do they want to say? <laughs> mm. So, mm, on the filming, yeah, it was like, a, let's say, a college movie filming. It was like, if I didn't do the movie when I was young, I would have probably have made it that way. It was more like, yeah, okay. Mm. Aha. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, Queenie, your thoughts on voices? I was kind of wondering if they were going to go with, like, a a mental health perspective on it, because, like, you know, he's all of a sudden hearing things that it's, is it it those people, or is it those people, or where is it coming from, and then, like, I thought it was not necessarily, because he comes to the conclusion with his girlfriend or whatever that, oh, I've been hearing people's thoughts all day, I mean... That's not the most probable like likelihood, but I mean it fits in with the narrative, I suppose. So I was kind of like, I mean, it was a good film, and I I thought it was pretty good, but uh, I was kind of I was expecting it to take sort of a different turn, I suppose. Mm. You know, yeah. I, I just remembered the girlfriend's response to his saying that, or lack thereof. <laughs> I was mm. just reminded about that. I've been hearing people's thoughts, and then she just goes off about something, completely ignoring that statement. Um, so maybe, maybe he's best shot of her then. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and oh, yeah. yep, yes. Uh, you, go ahead. I was just well, you're last, obviously. So you, James. <laughs> it, it's how I was wondering if you were going to remember me, then, <laughs> but. Or if you were just going to say, "Okay, on to the next movie." Uh, no, I was uh, going to introduce. I was going to introduce you, but then I guessed that you were coming in because obviously it's the alphabet and you're last, mm-hmm. so obviously it's your turn. So it's kind of redundant, but okay. I'm a bit of a control freak. <laughs> okay, so technically, yes. I now that um, I, uh, I, we, there is at least good reason to believe that uh, Dr. Smith made this as part of film school for an assignment for a project. It is fair to say that the entire raison d'etre of the film was to show off things like crossing the line and camera angles. It was, uh, he was being marked on technique and it had to be under 10 minutes. Um, So, no criticism of the technique beyond the obvious that it's a student film. It's probably his first film. (laughs) But but in terms of the story, first of all, hearing voices, I can name at least three programmes in which that's been the uh, premise, uh, hearing other people's thoughts. Uh, as uh, the, the rest of you have pointed out, it could, there could be the mental health angle, paranoid schizophrenia. Uh, uh, people do report, that people do genuinely believe that they are telepathic, uh, that they are hearing the true thoughts of the people who claim to love them, but really they hate them. Uh, that even if we were to steer away from the mole, from from the mole, from the whole mental health angle, though, the the uh, plot line between the uh, best friend and the girlfriend, the fact that they both dislike him and want to be together, that went nowhere. So in short. What was the fucking point? <laughs> the entire story was a complete and total waste. Just ended with a fortune cookie uh, after school special. Don't worry about other people judging you. Cliche. Uh, yes, the 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 actual technique of the filming and the editing was good or as good as can be expected for a student film. I'm assuming he got a high mark for his experimental filmmaking, but mm. the scripts, the story, the, 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 the broader message, the actual point. Why does this film exist except to get an A in film studies class? 
You know, well, we all, we all have to start somewhere, James. Like, sorry, Coco. Oh, I realise uh, that, but you know, couldn't couldn't you have included a story in your ten minute film? <laughs> you know, you you started a story and then it went nowhere. A story is over it. I suppose there's a kind of unspoken law in film that this kind of breaks. I guess you could call it the conservation of detail. You know, the idea that this um, girlfriend and um, best friend thing comes up. Um, in films, you don't bring something up unless it's going to be a serious story point. You don't mm. keep the bits where someone's like, I'm sorry, what was that again? You know, and it was just mishearing as opposed to him not be believing or something like that. So exactly. I guess it's sort of taboo for a film to... Mm. Um, yeah. Have something uh, like that, the girlfriend and the best friend, and it not be addressed. We're just so yeah. used to if it's in if it's a detail that the film shares, then it comes yeah, back. That that's a rule of any writing is uh, Chekhov's pistol. Um, if there's a pistol hanging off the wall in Act One, Scene One, someone has to get shot by the end of the play, or why is there a pistol there? But yeah, you can why? also uh, you you can actually put the pistol there to make us wonder, and the whole purpose with the, the movie is that we should discuss the thing that nothing happened. Oh, or we could oh. just punch the filmmaker in the face, no offense, Doctor Smith, and say, "Why did you waste my life?" <laughs> 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 uh. <laughs> oh, I'm not talking specifically about Doctor Smith, though. I'm talking about films like uh, games, like Bioshock Infinite. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. it. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <sighs> okay. Did I do uh... All of that for this? <laughs> yeah, it's just to make you upset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it's. Oh. That's it. It's it's trolling. <laughs> <laughs> it, we, we should watch to the end of the credits, see if there's a troll face. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's hidden in there somewhere, like it, they made it super tiny so they could put it as one of the periods. <gasps> yes, why do I get the feeling that Dr. Smith has never been to want to talk to me again? <laughs> I was, I'm actually going to make a note on one of my post-its not to have you both on the same show again. <laughs> Uh, yes, unfortunately, if you'd been able to attend, we could have had an interview with the writer-director and, and asked questions like, well, why did you include this? And what was your thinking about such and such? But maybe that'll happen in a... And how do you feel edition. about your mother? <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel about uh, your mother? No, that was like a Freudian joke. Like, like you know, it's like, and, and what do you think of your mother? It's sort but, of thing. Uh, just, just so that people don't think I'm a total bastard, whenever I watch a film, read a book, uh, watch a TV series, or do anything artistic, anything re regarding entertainment, etc., my first question is, without it's not even conscious, it's just, what is the meaning? What is the purpose? How does this uh, piece of entertainment affect my life? society, the future. What does this have to say? Uh, so when something like that just ends up with an after-school cliche, yes, it, it okay, it's only ten minutes, but still. So I'm just going to add one note, which is, um, having known James for a few years now, he does tend to be um, very critical and to have very high standards of anything that I've ever shown him, um, including my own film, of which he made, I think, a uh, like a 15-minute um, video uh, reviewing it, which was mixed, to say the least. So we have to... Uh, you have to be a bit thick-skinned. If, if James were a professional critic, he would have death threats. <laughs> so. Yes, in, in other words, Dr. Smith, please don't take it personally. I pan almost everything that enters my field of vision. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> so... Um, <clears throat> the uh, next film up uh, is uh, Miss Pepper. Um, uh, uh, where does one begin? Um, uh, my thoughts on Miss Pepper. Um, I think I kind of knew that it wasn't going to be the most um, cheerful of films um, from the off. I felt that you instantly felt there was a character there and you connected with her. Um, 
I think it's something you have to watch a few times in terms of getting the relevance of everything she says and how it all ties together. Um, I think that... I don't want to give too many spoilers, but I think that the the nature of the tragedy in her past, the exact nature of it, was uh, maybe a little bit of a cliché, um, that it could have been any number of other things. Um, but again, I thought... Um, Stylistically, uh, it worked. I thought it was beautifully shot, beautifully narrated. Um, I think that... Um, I don't know if the... Obviously, it's essentially, it's a one-woman show. I don't know if um, if the woman that we hear and see is also the writer and director, but I'm guessing... It is. It is, right. I got that feeling, um, which is very impressive, essentially. It's, it's, it's somebody in, in a flat with a camcorder um, and some editing software. Um, and... It felt very professional. You kind of feel with that one that uh, this person's got a bit of experience already um, and probably, I'm guessing, has done other projects since um, and could maybe go quite a lot further. So definitely I thought there was a lot of um, promise there. Um, And uh, yes, definitely about as powerful as a 15-minute film could possibly be, actually, I'd say. Um, and going now um, with reverse... Oh, no, if we can go alphabetically again, because I do know the filmmaker personally, so right. uh, anything I have to say will influence the other guests' opinions. So Okay, so, Koki Pirate. Great. Well, um, something I found myself wondering about after the movie was over is if this was a writer that, you know, she had already been writing and experienced the tragedy and could no longer go on writing, or if it's one of those situations that it is a writer that before beginning her career as a writer, she experienced this tragedy and writes this strong emotional stuff. Uh, If it's the latter case, then it actually makes an interesting point how um, we get, I guess um, our curiosity is peaked and we get entertainment from someone suffering. It could be an inspiration porn type situation where someone's just so inspiring because they're going on after this um, tragedy when, you know, these people are actually suffering. But that's the thing. I'm not sure what angle they were going for. It could have just been a writer who was already an established writer and then experienced the accident. Do they say in the film? Do they give you any indicator or? Um... No. Not to my... Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I couldn't pick anything uh, up. But yeah. I think maybe the point is that the best creativity comes from suffering, but that does also mean that a lot of the most creative people can't go on anymore. Look at Van Gogh, for example. Um, uh, look at uh, a lot of musicians. Look at a lot of... Um, but um, uh, in any case, um, Pinge. I was like, <clears throat> first of all, I get some, get some reference from other things I get a reference from a thing we see in on New Year's Eve in Sweden that is the the Duchess and the butler doing a show. I thought that was a fun so I get some scenes from other movies in in the whole movie and that is a bit fun but don't have anything to do with more than the sad experience. They also make uh, up for the sadness in the movie that is odd I don't know if the girl that did the movie have seen them or not but they surely make up the same sad feeling but I also get some kind of deadline thing as a writer you have a deadline and, and you so it's like the deadline so it's not about her death it's about the deadline of making this script, and then the script is over, and then you have uh, writers lost because you have done the script, and, uh, script or um, in my case, a music thing. So for me, it was about something like that. So, so I, I took it more, uh, I think, more mm, not literal or more philosophical. So, so that's what I saw at the moment. So it was like. Hmm, what is this? <laughs> mm. oh, oh, I like okay. again. I like the shooting and the the, the way they film the movie, uh, the angles, the near view of her, and so on. So it was 
effectively uh, footage on it that I liked. And the music, sorry, the music was like, yeah, it made it so dark. I like it. That was mm. good. Yeah, now I'm end. <laughs> Yes, I thought that the, the use of music was... Because, uh, you know, I've said before that one of my bugbears is the overuse of music. I, I thought the use of music was, um, if, you'd excuse, if you excuse the pun, uh, pitch perfect. Um, <laughs> okay, Queenie, your thoughts on Miss Pepper? Well, it explores sorts of feelings that, while not all of us have been uh, directly confronted with, all of us have some sort of... A second or third hand experience with I mean you've never really met anyone who hasn't had some sort of exposure to tragedy mm. and uh, I think it goes into the sorts of thoughts and feelings that you would get if you were in that sort of position in your life I think it's it's sort of it almost strikes me as something deeply personal and it, and yet, you know, it's a video and you're watching it. Um, the only negative critique I would have would be that when she got out of the, sh- the shower, her hair wasn't even wet or anything. But, I mean, I know it's just a film. Mm. It's one of my quirks. It's like, you just got out of the shower, you're not even wet. <laughs> I have to say, I didn't actually notice that. But yeah, it is like how in movies, why are you wearing makeup in bed? <laughs> Why are you going to bed with lipstick and mascara? But yeah, I would have. Yeah, actually, okay. She didn't think to to just douse a bit of water on her hair, um, but it's a minor quibble. Um, yeah. Maybe she thought maybe she was having a really good hair day, and she just took the <laughs> shower head and washed her body because she didn't want to fuck up the hair because it was already cool. There you go. <laughs> um, we'll, anything, we'll take that one. Yeah. Anything? Anything else to add, Queenie? No, I mean. I I hope I articulated my sentiments fairly well, but yeah, okay, okay. the that, only negative cool. thing would be that she wasn't wet when she got out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, I hope that criticism is passed on to to the filmmaker, you James. The hair wasn't wet. <laughs> well, um, I'll, be share, I'll be sharing this uh, video with her when it's up. The broadcast on an after midnight. The fact that she was nominated for the anti Oscars. Yeah, uh, but uh, yes. Um, okay, there are the minor technical quibbles. Uh, as a admittedly weak defence, I would point out that a lot of women with long hair uh, do wear shower caps specifically uh, to avoid getting their hair wet. But, but she wasn't was wearing, wearing a shower cap. cap. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That's why I said it. I don't wear it. <laughs> but um, but still. Uh, beyond that, th- this was the, it's kind of the opposite of Voices by uh, Dr. Smith, because uh, in, the, in that film, the technical uh, aspect of it was all there, the message, the meaning, etc., there was none. Whereas uh, with Miss Pepper uh, by Mio Shabin, uh, written, directed, edited, the whole shebang, starring. Um, the technical flaws are irrelevant because the meaning, the message, the impact, the soul mm. is so deep. It works on so many layers. Um, mm. As you said yourself, Alex, you have to watch it two or three times in order to fully appreciate the meaning of everything she says. Mm. Um, As she gazes out of the window, a truly uh, beautiful, profound and poetic scene. Um, The outline is finished. Destiny must be resolved. And then, uh, just towards the end, our greatest pretenses are built up not to hide the evil or the ugliness, but the emptiness the hardest thing to hide is something that is not there. Because the entire film is her struggling to cope with her emptiness, her isolation, her grief, um, having dinner with no one, for example, 
and raising a glass to the empty chairs. Uh, mm. The mental health aspect. It's mm. not only that she's suffering from grief, but um, possibly clinical depression, including auditory and visual hallucinations. Again, that's never explored. You can see it in the broader philosophical sense that, uh, she, as Pingay said, she creates through her suffering, and as a result, once the manuscript is written, her life is over. And as Koki Pirate said, is, is it that she... Uh, it, is it that the accident happened before she became a writer and she wrote through her pain, or is it that she's already an established writer? Th there are so many ways to perceive it. There is... Ah, it, it is just so beautiful. And yes, again, there are, there are flaws, there are inconsistencies. I myself, I relate to it as a writer, I relate to it as a mental health advocate, I relate to it as a quote-unquote fan of tragedies such as this. Um, <laughs> the, word the words impact and soul, this is, a clo this is the closest thing you are ever going to get to one of the Korean tragedies that I adore. So, again. You know, <laughs> when you brought up, like, the different ways to interpret, I just thought of the opening statement. Or, I'm not sure if it was the opening statement, um... It's not easy waking up and being Miss Pepper. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could mean that. And I guess it goes into my own little sort of which is it kind of idea. Does it mean that it's, you know, it used to be easier, but now there's this tragedy? Or, you know, she's writing and she's being an inspiration of someone who went through pain. Um, mm. Yes, again, yeah. that, that, is a, that is a question. The idea of the writer... Uh, herself or himself in my case as a character you know, watching that film myself as a writer it made me think on the fact that yes in order to be a writer I do, in order to write the stories that I sell I do have to become a different person mm. and I also got I got a thing with a, I, I don't know if it, if it was dictionary so, uh, that you read from but I, I, got, a, I got a thing as uh, the many writers, many things that write, they take odd words and they take wonderful words and they put them together and, and they make some soup of all those wonderful words. And for, for me, it was like this dictionary sound with the, all the books. It was like she looked through all the dictionaries. I got a thought. So they looked through all the dictionaries to find the most wonderful word to describe what she tried to, and, and then it went a bit too far, I don't think, I don't know if it did, but, but the feeling, uh, you tried so much to make the <clears throat> perfect ending of a story, ending of your life, ending of everything, so I got to, this, uh, that feeling when he, so, when he was there with the, her books, and I was like, hmm... <laughs> One final point I want to mention about the film, um, uh, Pinge, the the books that she was looking at, the, the books that she was looking at were encyclopedias, not dictionaries. So uh, they were, they, it was uh, facts rather than di the different meaning of the words. But I do still take your point to heart about. Um, choosing the most beautiful words to describe her points, but um, what she said during what, what she said during the narration in the scene when she was um, pouring through the encyclopedia and making notes, uh, history has a way of deflating problems. So they, they, they remain unsolved. They're still just as insolvable. But once you reach a certain point in your life or in time, they don't matter anymore. So, again, given the whole theme of the story... <laughs> but then, uh, that, that, there is the greatness with the thing, because we, we have the books that 
you know what the book is about. I don't know, but I still have a profound meaning. So they will have greatness in the movie. So, <laughs> yeah, but, so again, but uh, the point is that it is about uh, you know in, in suicide prevention in mental health. Uh, there, there is uh, one of the warning signs of suicide is. Um, Becoming content because it's not a problem anymore, or at least you, you realise that the problem mm. is now distant. Uh, the line from "Let It Go" in Frozen. Um, uh, it's amazing how some distance makes everything s- seem small, and the fears mm. that once controlled me can't get to me at all. Uh, mm. So again, it's not that the problem is solved; it's just that she doesn't care anymore, and. So mm. as a, so much depth. yeah, God, I love this film. But uh, Pokey, <laughs> if you wanted to say something as well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just thinking about um, that scene where she's sitting down and looking at the empty chair. It, it's almost when someone's missing or someone's gone. Sometimes it feels sort of like a phantom limb type thing. Not mm. that they actually attached, but, you know, someone close to you, you want to say something to them as if they were still in the room, and, you know, I guess um, that's something that, you know, really got to me. That's it. Yes, uh, one of the most heartbreaking scenes from Babylon 5, uh, Alex and I have watched up to, we've watched past that point, but uh, uh, whether you know uh, the series or whether you know the series know. or not anyone should be able to relate to this uh captain sheridan's sis- sister desperately trying to convince him to forget his late wife or, well not to forget her but to move on with his life you know she died two years ago so why do i have to keep reminding myself that she's gone Sometimes I'll watch the news, I'll see something interesting, and I'll think to myself, oh, I have to remember to mention this to Anna. Sometimes I turn to say something to her, and she's not there. But just Mm. for a moment, I don't know why she's not there. Mm. And then I remember. Yeah. Yes, um, I'd like to add, uh, when it comes to, because I'd like to say something about the, the things touched upon to do with creativity, I would uh, I think I'd tie it in with the mental health aspect as well, that although you are kind of writing through the pain, even if about the pain, a bit like Van Gogh painting through the pain, um, in a way, ironically, yeah, you have to be, kind of become a different person which I suppose ties in with the point about distance in a sense, even though you're, you're kind of doing it therapeutically and it's kind of cathartic. Uh, when it comes to waking up, I immediately related to that um, because OCD, and I understand it, Queenie can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is also true of schizophrenia. These are mental health problems where it takes a very long time, like an hour or two to wake up and your brain is throwing stuff at you and you, you've got to negotiate this minefield of OCD, I would say, it's like you're getting loads of pop-ups, like you're starting up the machine and that the anti-malware software hasn't come up yet. And it's like get closing all these fucking pop-ups, but every pop-up up is likely to be a bad thought, bad feeling, or a bad thought that has bad feelings with it, the worst memories, etc. Um, and so, yeah, it's almost like uh, uh, rebooting the computer and it takes a couple of hours before I'm the Alex that people know um, I don't know if schizophrenia is also but I, and as I understand it, schizophrenia is another problem where it's quite, quite difficult to wake up am I right about that Queen? Yeah, it's, uh, it tends to be difficult to wake up you tend to have slow memories on you know, well one you don't want to wake up and then it's like, or at least with me mm. And then, uh, secondly, it takes a while for everything to just filter back in. Mm. Then I'm happy. I just wake up, go up, and then I do much of things, and then my brain explodes. <laughs> oh, thanks for rubbing it in, Pingate. No, I'm just kidding. That was terrible. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> it was like <laughs> so I, I go up and that no twenty five thousand thoughts is like not now. What the heck? <laughs> I don't need it. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, yes, this is why I dub my problems the sound of drums. Will you shut the fuck up? Yeah. But basically, it's one, and, yeah. just as a final point, then one of the most amazing things about this film, uh, bearing in mind everything we've said about. Um, um, mental illness and tragedy is, as far as I'm aware, Mio Shabin, the writer, director, star, editor, and everything else, chief cook and bo- bottle washer of Miss Pepper, has uh, never suffered from any mental health problems, again, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, uh, ha- there has been tragedy in her family. You mentioned before, Alex, that she it, she, it does seem like she does have experience. Uh, yes, yeah, she's been making films since she was seven. Uh, another one of her films, uh, Too Close... Oh, oh, yes, this... Excuse me, she's never suffered from... As far as I'm aware, to the best of my knowledge, she's never suffered from mental health issues herself. But uh, one of her other films, Too Close to Home... Uh, is a documentary about how in 1995 her uncle, uh, who suffered from schiz- who still suffers from schizophrenia, uh, 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 um, murdered her grandfather. Oh, oh. yes, there, there right. was, for me one of the most profound scenes in the film is when um, I think it's Miosha's cousin says that there. Her uncle, you know, she, he actually went to the mental health, uh, he, local, he went to the local mental health institute, the local mental hospital, whatever the term is, in that part of America, and told the staff there that, yes, he heard voices that were telling him to kill people, and they sent him home. Mm. If only oh. they'd done their job, then... Uh, <laughs> their grandfather would still be alive. Mm. So, yes, I was going to say, uh, my original point was that uh, she had never suffered anything like that personally, so to be able to um, invoke mm. those kind of emotions. But, uh, but yes, although um, the tragedy in her family was different, uh, what, what it was still a tragedy re- related to mental health, I would still say it is uh, different enough that it's she is not she was not simply um uh taking real life and mm. it, it, this what uh, miss pepper wasn't based on a true story the way that she yeah, can it's... still convey such issues of grief and isolation yeah and pain well it, it's yeah it's 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 all a melting mm-hmm. pot isn't it um Okay, um, would it be all right to move on to the next film mm-hmm. now? Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, the next one is Russian Dolls, and apologies for throwing, uh, or for most of you, a foreign language film. Yeah. I will say, though, uh, when I first saw this, and it was made by a friend of mine, <laughs> this is so nepotistic, um, and we went together to see it in a, at a screening in Brick Lane uh, with other shorts, um, the first week, um, he handed the wrong disc in. It didn't have English language subtitles. So imagine the poor people <laughs> trying to appraise this film yeah. without actually understanding the dialogue. Um, but um, I don't know if, it, if, if reading... Maybe Koki can tell us if, if, if maybe reading it loses any, uh, any, any of the, the sort of passion that you get. Because as we all know, continental European languages convey pas- passions in a way that um, someone like me can't, with, with this kind of accent, I would, I would sort of argue. Um, uh, it's quite difficult. Um, um, I'm going to do a you, James, and say, because a friend of mine made this, um, I'm going to go last. Um, uh, but I will stick with the alphabetical system, I guess, to be consistent. So, uh, Koki, your thoughts on Russian Dolls? Well, um, to answer your first question, if there's anything lost in... The subtitles, um, what stuck out to me the most, actually, is, um, I think the guy asks, um, 
And how long was it before you learned her profession or did you know what her profession was mm. or something like that? Literally translated was, um, and you didn't notice that she was a whore. You know, <laughs> it had a bit right. more of a pejorative. Ah. Uh, oh, okay. Miso- not misogynist, but anti-sex but, worker but it, sort of. It definitely suited the character to phrase it that way, I guess, yeah. Uh, As a, and she didn't know her profession. Sounds so polite, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I really like this film because it was just so tense. I, I, I was really expecting to see brains um, on one of those shots. <laughs> um, and just the film moved from there, so... Uh, that's that. That's I guess what I really liked. Um, the love story was interesting enough, uh, and you know the situation where you can take him down, but he has friends. So um, you know I can't help myself because I'm an illegal immigrant. The sort of feeling of futility and um, powerlessness is also kind of cool. But I guess what really got me was just the tension of Russian roulette, which I don't know it. It seems kind of um, overdone, but a lot of times when I see Russian Roulette, I don't really feel that kind of tension. So for like this little independent film to nail it, well, I don't know. I liked it. Mm. Ah, so, Pinke, uh, your thoughts on uh, Russian Dolls? Yeah, <laughs> it was like... <laughs> uh, I was a double about the thing, because... First of all, the Russian, Russian roulette thing was like intriguing, and and the love story is intriguing, and and I. Eh. But then in the in the end, I was like, shoot the fucking bastard! You have one <laughs> one bullet, shoot him, and then you go with your girlfriend and ride in the storms out or something. It was like, do you? Re- I I got that feeling all the through all the the story like. Eh. Do you really think he going to let you have her? He's uh, he wouldn't. He will not. <laughs> mm. But that's probably me more than the story. <laughs> uh, sadly, but that, then I like the filming and the, the, the way they filmed it and the change of camera through uh, and trying to get the emotion like oh shit I will going to die now and so on. So in that way, yes. Um, like the idea and the idea of the filming, but for me it was like, yeah, shoot the bastard in the head. You have the chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, but and I'm a Buddhist, so I would say, calm <laughs> him down and be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. The film Russian Dolls made a Buddhist want to kill. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, and Queenie, uh, your thoughts on Russian dolls? Well, I definitely like the suspense. Oh. They kept you thinking, like, oh, the guy's going to die. Or, you know, whatever. And, mm. <laughs> or, yeah, that makes it sound so whatever. <laughs> um, mm. Just the whole, the suspense. And, like, they went into the relationship with the guy and the woman a little bit. Like, you don't know how long it carried on or anything, but uh, it was clear he, he was at least willing to uh, feign taking a bullet for her, potentially actually taking a bullet for her, but then she was... Yeah, mm. that was sad. Yeah, th- there's that line of, I hope uh, that tonight... Oh, no, sorry, I hope this game has made you realize how much this woman means to you. And you kind of think this guy's not that bad after all, but exactly how sadistic was that? Um, but yeah, he was prepared to take um, take a bullet. Ah, um, okay. And now we have you, James. Well, I have to say, when when I rewatched this recently, I thought Angel is a kind. I never this before, but Angel must be a kindred spirit of uh, having read almost every short story. Of yours, you James, by now. Mm. I was thinking, yes, this again. is all. You, 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 uh, yes. uh, again, this is the people. That, uh, this is the mistake that people make when they recommend films to me because they have seen the films that I praise, but they haven't actually felt. 
you know, again, I oh yes, you James is being so pretentious, but for me, it's about the emotional meaning, it's about the impact, it's about what the film means beyond the running time, beyond uh, the technical issues, the uh, the uh, excellence of the acting, etc. So mm. first and foremost, everyone else has mentioned the tension of the Russian roulette, uh, mm. the the. the of Russia, the Russian roulette sequence, the, the basis of the film, um, you don't give a loaded gun to someone who's going to shoot you, and you don't put a loaded gun to your head. These two logical premises made it obvious from the very beginning he w- the gun was not loaded. It was all a mind game. He wasn't going to risk being shot. The pimp wasn't going to risk being shot himself, and he certainly wasn't going to take the one in three, one in uh, two (laughs) risk of uh, killing himself before he he had made his quote-unquote point. And this film is so disgustingly sex-negative. It's uh, didn't couldn't you tell that she was a whore? This, this is an MRA film. This is rocking Mister. This is rocking Mister E's favorite movie. You stupid fool! You fallen in love with a whore. You're willing to kill yourself for a whore. Let me teach you a hard and brutal lesson in which no person actually dies. Uh, as Zianu uh, pointed out, in America in the 1940s, 1930s, when a prostitute was murdered, the official, well, not not official, but the uh, the shorthand used by the police was no human beings involved. <sighs> but <sighs> what? The fuck? So, again, there was no tension because I knew the gun was empty. And I I was waiting for the evil, sadistic twist. Where I hope you appreciate what... Hope, I hope this game has taught you to appreciate what she means. The actual meaning of that statement. She's a whore. And, yes, uh, also the fact she's an illegal immigrant... They can report him to the police, but he has, quote-unquote, friends who will kill her. Uh, This is the way the world is, and this is the way that it's always going to be. And also the fact that because it was a short film, we never saw their relationship. There there was not a chance for it to blossom. There was... um, we we never got to really feel anything for the character to see the love develop. Uh, one day he meets a woman, doesn't realise that she's a whore, and two scenes later, uh, two scenes later, he's willing to kill himself for her. It, <laughs> again, as a hopeless romantic who genuinely believes in uh, love at first sight, but. Uh, but again, remember, considering that this will be this will be perceived by MRAs who watch this as the ultimate MRA film. Uh, uh, this, uh, sorry, this is the ultimate MRA short film. The, uh, the ultimate MRA feature length film is Fight Club, but because they one, don't get the fucking point. <laughs> They're one too thing, stupid. One thing, really, Jane, with the commentary is that I don't think that people see the movie like you do. They see it, actually. I think they see... They don't see the background of uh, the horse and blah, blah, blah. They see Pretty Woman from the 80s that, that a man yeah. is willing to offer his life for a, a whore, but he do it for love, and then in the end he is... It's a sad story. It, it yeah, didn't went his way. <laughs> To, so, to use the um, uh, MRA vernacular, though, the guy's problem is that he is a white knight in Mangina. 
that he is saving. He wants to. He thinks he's fallen in love with this prostitute, this whore, this but sex I don't worker. See, I, I, don't, I don't see. I don't think people see that that way. Actually, uh, but I understand your point. So I, I'm actually with you in many ways. But I don't see. I don't think that m- many people see it that way. As, I put, think it, put it this way. Nobody else has seen Kim Ki Duk's films in this chair. Kim Ki Duk's portrayals of prostitution, sex work, which are slammed across the world as misogynistic, etc., are better than the portrayal of sex work in this film. Because mm-hmm. there was really no portrayal of sex work in this film. There was just the two guys arguing over price. Absolutely, I agree with you. Many points, but I, I just don't see. I see. The, I, I think most people see the first thing that uh, some kind of romantic glare about he's offering his life for the girl yeah, that he loves. It's, I it's, think that that is what they, they see, and then if oh, you, it's, they it's, think harder, then they might get to your point. <laughs> yeah, again, it's it's not. That's the thing. It's not a story for them. It won't be a story about. Um, the tragedy of forced sex work, the fact that she's an illegal immigrant, the fact that she's not a, she's been probably been trafficked, she's not a willing mm. sex worker, etc., etc., etc. To them, it's just a uh, pretty woman, the yeah. cliche, the cliche of the hooker with a heart of gold. All she, all she needs, she just needs a man to come and save her, <laughs> and. And so again, that this this is so sex negative. You know, even if you look at it from the other way, that it's Prince Charming coming, the White Knight in Mangina coming to save the quote unquote whore from the evil pimp. Uh, and but then that brings us back to the point. Ha! You think you can save a whore, but I know the actual truth. And yes, no human beings involved. And uh, again, that might be why he did the movie to get you upset, to get people <laughs> upset, to actually think like this. I mean, I devil's advocate, I know, but it's. <laughs> no, that that is a very good point. Um, again, Kim, Kim, oh yes, maybe I will marry Kim Ki Duk. Shut up. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, Kim Ki Duk, he neither praises nor condemns. He just shows the reality. He yeah. just, it, and then it's uh, it's up to us to walk away from that and say either, ooh, she got what she deserved, or ooh, she was a hero, or hang on a minute, that was so fucked up on every possible level. (laughs) (sighs) Okay. Um, Right. I I don't know what to say by this point, because I don't know if I'm um, saying what I thought of the film or defending my friend. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, Who who is most certainly, I can assure you, not a misogynist. (laughs) Um, and who is going to hear this podcast? I, I thought, shall I hold back? Fuck it. This is what people pay to see. They pay to see you, James, lose his shit over a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Well, I think that there was meant to be a sense of um, futility that came with the twist. Uh, uh, with... Yes, I, I got that. Uh, we got that loud and clear. Thank you very much. But I get, for what point? For what purpose? They didn't. Uh, they didn't show uh, the woman long enough for us to develop any kind of sympathy for her. We didn't. Because it was a short film, if it had been again, it's the it's the same with uh, every other sh- every other short film we've uh, reviewed so far, except for Miss Pepper. Oh no, this is only the third. Excuse me. It, it, it's the it's the same for Voices. If only it had been longer. If only they'd been able to. If only Angel had been able to flesh it out more, mm. instead of just one scene in bed 
I'm an illegal immigrant. If uh, if he goes to prison, his quote unquote friends will kill me. Mm. Yeah. If if we actually saw that, if we actually felt that, if it was a genuine exploration. But a note to you, James. You are a bit biased by by the movie with Pepper because you have background story. You have. <laughs> if I look at the movie with Pepper, I don't see all the things you see because oh, I uh, again. I didn't know any, I didn't know anything. Now of, <laughs> I didn't know anything about the movie Pepper going in. Yeah, but you know Pepper, you know the person, uh, not Pepper exactly, but uh, so yeah. you are a bit biased. <laughs> <laughs> and, but no, um, again, this is the thing. Again, you, James, are sounding so pretentious. I do see the wider point, the underlying message. Alex, you saw things like my review of... Um, you saw things like my review of uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World on Facebook, mm. a romantic comedy with um, computer game battles. No, this is... This is an indictment of the of relationships you know, but, in the but, but, 21st you know, century. <laughs> you know, James, I, I know that, but I'm... Still the devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and on to the uh, penultimate offering, uh, the only uh, animated uh, nomination, um, a film uh, which has received quite a bit of attention already, known as The Maker. And, um, oh, what did I think of it? Um, I, I think I actually did have to watch it twice to really take it in, maybe because I don't normally watch that kind of animation. Uh, and I think I got what the sort of point was, that it's a kind of cycle of life kind of thing, um, with, with with a timer running out. There was no TikTok, because it was a sand timer. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're creating the next life, and each time... Um, I don't know, I was slightly confused. I think the first time around I was thrown, because I thought the first rabbit puppet looked kind of male to me, and the second one looks kind of female, pardon the gender binary there. So I thought, is he making a bride? I think that's what threw me. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, there, there was something for an animated feature with two characters, a huge sense of atmosphere, I thought. that there was, uh, There's definitely a kind of, is, is ethos the right word? There was, there was definitely something about this that set it apart from uh, most animated shorts, I felt. Um, and I liked how it was kind of, in a way, looked kind of scary, but kind of beautiful. Um, it actually made me think of the kind of thing Queenie would draw. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll get to what, uh, to what Queenie thinks of it. Um, uh, I was a bit puzzled by, uh, on a practical level, and also on a creative level, those creatures, in a film called The Maker, these creatures who make with their hands didn't have hands, they didn't have digits. In fact, there's some cheating in the animation to have them hold or do anything. They just basically have pointy things. That was a bit weird. I don't know why they made that decision. But that, I'm focusing now on something kind of minor. Um, but um, essentially, yeah, I mean, I found it enjoyable. I just sense thought-provoking. But I think more that I'd, I think I, I was left with quite a... I don't want to give too much away about it, but quite an indefinable kind of uh, feeling by the end but I only really got that on um, on the second viewing um, going alphabetically again, uh, Koki, your thoughts on The Maker I actually like your take better than the way I perceived it, the idea of the cycle of life that you want to confer your experience to the next generation uh, mm. before your time runs out for me, it struck me as something, um, a fascination I guess we've always had, you know, be it iRobot or Frankenstein, the idea mm. of making a kind of artificial life form, a homunculus, though in this case the being itself is a uh, being like this. They're getting mm. all the parts together, and then at the mm. end he's trying to figure out how to give it a soul, which, yeah. you know, he succeeds through music. Um, mm. Though I can see your point of view that it's like you're trying to bring up another generation and train them. But, you know, the idea <laughs> that you can create something that would be able to participate in the human experience. But um, I guess I didn't really put too much emphasis on the timer, which, you know, makes your 
your take on it a bit more plausible. But um, mm. I, I just like the idea of human, but not human. But I, I want to create a being that can feel, which yeah. is, you know, something that humans have always been sort of um, fascinated with, something that, um, yeah, pretty much since the dawn of science fiction, if not sooner. I guess there are also Jewish accounts of golems and magical yeah. entities like this. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, just sort of rambling now. Point is, I thought it was really cool. Um, I did actually. Yeah, the 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 it almost give, giving it a soul through music is a very good way of putting it. Um, and yeah, because at first I thought is the point to teach the new one to be a violinist, um, and then of course the the sort of moment of um, of the disappearance uh, spoilers of the well, we call it the first one. We don't know how long this has been going on. Also, what's the point of life if if it's literally that this is a continuous thing that just goes on in this room? of rabbit puppets making the next rabbit puppets, learning and perhaps changing a little bit each time if they learn a different tune to play on the violin while the time is going, and oh, better make the next one and then disappear, boom. Um, is that even meaningful life? But who's to judge that? Maybe it is by the standards of that creature who, of course, never knows, never properly gets to know its creator, I suppose, other than being taught what the tune and being given the form and... And also, life is always briefer than, than, than we think. And the, the, there's the grains of sand, I suppose, has more of a death metaphor than the ticking clock, which would have been perhaps more obvious. But I suppose the um, grain of sand... Is, 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 am I even right in thinking that, that was, uh, that's an Ingmar Bergman thing? Um, but people think of that. The, the, like, the, like the sands through the hourglass. These are the days of our lives. Um, <laughs> so... Um, once again, uh, Pinge is next. Yeah, I got two stories of this one. Uh, in the beginning, I was actually on your trace, uh, like he actually was making his mate, and and I uh, of some always I get reference to horror movies and so on. So I get a reference to a thing called May, that where a girl. Uh, actually kill people to make her wonderful maid because it had a it had a scary look to it uh, the whole movie so it was a bit like it could go either way it could go well or it could go or uh, scary but then in the end it was more like a, a sort of like a reincarnation story it's more like uh, he mm. teached himself to uh, that he made his reincarnation, he made his next life, he made his next person in his next life, and and and, yeah. uh, and so on. So 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 when it ended, it was like, ah, this is about reincarnation. Is uh, it the doctor regenerating? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me while I sharpen my blade. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on, thinking. No, is uh, I'm actually. <laughs> it's more, uh, I'll end it there because the thing is with my thought about them that's the, the two thoughts and then I like I'm an enemy fan I like this uh, dull mood dull mood you don't call it that but when you have real clay and real dull it's like the whole art of making some movies like that is like every time I see it I'm like this is good and then some of the time it's not but this one was actually good because it made you think. Um, so, yeah, cool movie. I like it. <laughs> uh, I would say um, so you and I both had that same feeling of the, uh, the creature wanting a mate, and, of course, the reference for something like this. I know uh, Koki mentioned the golem, of course, but there is also, obviously, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. Yeah. And in the, no in the novel... Um, what is the name of the monster? Um, Frank, Dr. Frank, or well, it's actually even a qualified doctor, but the Frankenstein character is arrogant enough to call his creation Adam, um, and in the actual book, and this is only kept in certain versions, like the Branner version, um, the creation uh, turns up demanding a mate. Adam, uh, uh, you know, if I am Adam, I demand an Eve. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so that that's understandable. We both we both kind of thought that. Um, as, as a Swedish person who likes his films, am I right to to see some uh, some Bergman? There's Ingmar Bergman in this. 
uh, it is the dark thing, yeah, of course, uh, Bergman. But, but the thing is, I actually, I'm uh, probably some of the few people in Sweden that think Bergman, Bergman is an uh, over-pretentious fuck of shit. Because <laughs> he is like too much of, he, he, he have his di- demons and he, uh, every movie is like, ugh, please. <laughs> but yeah, you have the dark and the, the, the so yes, some Bergman, <laughs> yeah, but wrong <laughs> person to ask, I can say. <laughs> Aha. Ah, so, uh, I picked the wrong Swedish film buff to ask about Ingmar Bergman. <laughs> yeah, the only one, probably. <laughs> <coughs> uh, Queenie, your thoughts on The Maker? I really like the human teeth. And, like, the different textures and things they had in there. Well, I I mainly noticed the human teeth thing because I actually bought human teeth off the internet one time. It was pretty cool. Ooh, wow. You get them, like, 30 bucks, you get some molars and pre-molars. And, uh, (laughs) it's one of these weird quirks I have. Like, Like, I wanted to reach out and touch the film because I was like, there's so many different textures in there. I want to touch all of them. (laughs) I want to touch uh, all the textures, but <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> and uh, it's just one of the. Uh, I liked it primarily on on that basis, you know, puppets doing stuff and whatever, you know, the the rabbit doll thing, and mm. but I really liked the different textures and the music and and how it how it all kind of flowed together. Oh, okay. Um, what do you think of the fact that I said it made me think of something that you might make? Well, when you were when you were uh, when we were watching it, I was actually thinking, could I make something like that? Aha! Uh-huh. I want a bunny doll, damn it! Well, you have to make one. I'll have to make it with a nice little code. And then it can make the next one, which can make the next one, and it may never end. But you have to give them a violin. <laughs> or, ele- so, or well, electric guitar you know bringing up the the violin you know it seemed like a last minute thing he's like I want to imprint it I want to give it a soul or I want to give it life he's like what do I do what do I do he's like ah music you know which maybe the other bunny would define life as being something different and confer some other kind of attribute to it that would that's... you know like maybe do a painting <sighs> for the other one but that was, you know. why, was why, why I saw the reincarnation thing in this, because he bring up the violin, not because he wants to make her something else, because he, he is the violin, he is the one that plays violin. <laughs> mm. So that's why he plays, he plays because that is what he teach himself uh, in the next life, because that is what he have learned. Mm. Hmm. Aha. Uh-huh. And, uh, oh, go ahead. Mm, sorry, no, no, carry on, Cookie. No, no, I, I just sort of drift off into the and I'm just wondering if it were my job to make one of these things and I had a limited amount of time to create another soul, what would I mm. use to sort of transplant the soul into it? Like, what would mm. I show it or what would I do for it? That, you know, I can say, this is what it means to be alive. This is life. Mm. This is the breath of life. Breathe it, you know. Hmm. Ah. And uh, you, James, your thoughts on the maker? Drop all of the reincarnation cycle of life, meaning of life, bullshit. You think that he's making his bride, but no, you didn't pay attention to the hourglass, so no, he is making his replacement. He dies. Oh, I, sorry, I thought you were my creator and I was your Eve and we were going to be happy together, but no, you've sentenced me to death. That's it. It's the heart. You think they're going to live happily ever after, but no, one of them dies. It's the same, it's the same lazy, irritating troll twist at the end of Russian Roulette. And, ah, Again, you can read all of you can you can read all of the cycle of life and breath of life and what is the meaning of life and reincarnation shit into it, but at the end of the day, when all is said and done, it was made to 
trick you. It was an emotional deception. You think they're going to live happily ever after, but you failed to heed proper attention to the hourglass at the very beginning. Or again, game. It was made to make you think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it doesn't make me want to think. It makes me want to kick the animator's head in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but, so, but you want to kick everyone in. <laughs> so you don't have any thoughts on the violin, like that moment of hesitation? Because it didn't seem as though he knew what he was doing. Oh, that's the thing. He didn't. The whole point was... Uh, his pr- the whole point was he had experienced exactly the same thing just uh, 30, sec- 30 minutes earlier. His predecessor gave him the books without a word, waved goodbye, disappeared into the ether. Uh, what's this book? How to make a rabbit. You have to make a rabbit, otherwise the chain will be broken. Well, fuck that. You know, it's a late... First, it's a labour of Sisyphus, which, again, is another cliché. Sisyphus, in Greek mythology, rolled boulders to the top of a mountain only for them to roll back again. So he he had to keep doing that for all of eternity. But you you can also also see a positive thing. He can change the future. Sisyphus cannot change the future. He can make a better bunny. He can make it... In, yeah, but, but no. Uh, yeah, I, but it's a short. Ha- Hello, it's a short movie. It's like it's not that this movie is going to represent all your life. <laughs> it's, well, that that is the point. Again, the limitations of animation, uh, making something like this by hand. Again, if only it was longer. But to rely on... They did. You know, you said, Alex, before, uh, please excuse the obvious gender binary. No, that, <laughs> they were fucking counting on that. You Do you think that the uh, first bunny chose pink by accident? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it. But on the other hand, yeah. if we're going to do a movie for for yeah. a general basis of people that then you don't, oh, just, don't do a cop. <laughs> uh, so, so I can just imagine the animator saying, oh yes, uh, circle of life, circle of life and reincarnation and building a better future and inspiring the next generation. <laughs> it was a troll movie. You thought you wanted us to think that he was making his bride, but no, it, is, it isn't representative <laughs> of life. It is representative of hell, a never-ending Sisyphusian labour with each one making their replacements, doomed to die the second they are created. Admit it, you passive-aggressive son of a bitch. <laughs> Everybody is doomed to die James, the second sorry, one, they're created. One thing, James. One thing, James. I like you, but I think you think too much. <laughs> Yo, hold on. I just have to say, if that genuinely was the case, yeah. death to the author, I like my version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that, that is true. Um, whatever, the, whatever the animator actually intended is largely irrelevant. It's the, question, the question is what the film means to you. So yes, it is wonderful that you got something uh, positive and life-affirming out of it, but I saw it, it was just the look on, this, on the second rabbit's face, the female rabbit's face, as the, um, as the hourglass turned. The, exactly the same look on the first rabbit's face at the beginning of the film as I, I've watched it three times so I can go through it and yes it, it, the, the, every rabbit who is trapped in this never ending cycle as I say this is my this is my one of my interpretations of hell um, not of life <laughs> But uh, every rabbit spends the first 30 seconds or so of their 30-minute life saying, what the fuck? You mean I'm... And also, if, <laughs> if doing some critic of it, it was like, yes, if, I also saw the woman, the woman, the woman, the woman, and then it was a guy. Yeah. It was like, what? What happened here? <laughs> it was like the story just ended and 
then it was him. Uh, why, uh, the, the, uh, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. this, um, <laughs> if it makes if it makes anyone feel any better, this um, I do have the exact same reaction to Korean directors like Park Chan Wook. Do not use the ha ha switch around. You thought it was going to be a happy ending, but no, emotional troll trap, or <laughs> I will fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's obviously the kind of film that can divide a room, and the Buddhists saw reincarnation, the Doctor Who fans saw a parallel there, because we're all destined to die the second we're created, just as every Doctor. There's always destiny, there's always foreshadowing, there's always you were made to one day die, um, and you can't, you can't rewrite that. Um, and um, I there think is, we've had. There is the whole point, though, of the your entire purpose, your sole per- reason for living is to create your successor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but you still get to enjoy music and things along the way, and that's why I said. Um, can, if... can you enjoy? <clears throat> can you enjoy music in thirty minutes or however long the hour? Uh, everything's relative. Thirty minutes could be a long lifespan for that creature, like a mayfly. Mm. I just like the idea of art being the soul, or in this case, music mm. being the soul. Yeah. So, you know, enjoy the music. Do they have time to enjoy the music? Music is their entire entity. That's what they are, so... Yeah. And does the song change? Mm. And for me, this film is actually the conversation afterwards, because I see all the things that you, you, you uh, James see in the movies, like cliches, like trolls, like Blah blah blah. I see all that mm. because it is actually, but at the same time, it, it has some questions and they have some things. And, and the conversation yeah. after is the most important thing with that movie because it is so short, it cannot make the whole story. So it just have to evoke those feelings and get us, yeah, what the fuck, this is real yeah, or not. I, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think that James um, has a knack for an eye for the emotional story which comes from the kind of writer that he is. Just as when I watched Voices, I'm watching something by somebody in film school from the perspective of somebody who studied the technical aspect of how to make a film and focused in on, ah, okay, I see what you're doing there, whereby you can spot, if you've ever studied media and filmmaking, you you know what they're doing. And you know if someone knows what they're doing. So it's kind of James is like that when it comes to the emotional story. Yes. And also, yeah, yeah, uh, sure. another, another, another aspect of it uh, is the fact that, um, Alex, you mentioned you brought stop, the fact that you're a Doctor Who fan, the concept of reincarnation. Um, Pinge, as a Buddhist, uh, uh, not, sorry, Alex brought regeneration, uh, Pinge brought reincarnation. Mm-hmm. Koki Pirates, uh, the concept of music as their entire being, music as the soul, I agree. I definitely see your point on that one, but for me, the thing that I truly brought to it was my underlying um, uh, premise, precepts, one of the foundations of who I am, that life is freedom. Take right. away freedom... It's not life. It's hell. Your sole Absolutely. purpose, your sole purpose to for ex, your sole reason to exist, the sole reason why you were created was to create your successor. And also, you watch the person who created you die, knowing exactly exactly the same thing is going to happen to you in thirty minutes. And Pinge, what you say about improving the next generation, etc. It's true on an evolutionary. Oh. It's, it's true in an evolutionary sense. Perhaps everybody is able to create a slightly better version, etc. Et it, it is kind of. It, it it could be seen as a metaphor for. Um, it could be seen as a metaphor for kind of Mayfly evolution, that sort of thing. But um, at the core of it. 
All I'm thinking is, bitch, you tr you used the you th you used one of the biggest cliches in filmmaking. Ha ha! You thought there were the, you thought that there was going to be a happy ending, but no, they're doomed to die. To eat that. And second, you have reduced life, i.e. freedom, to a Sisyphusian task. Again, I'm not saying it's, that's right, that's not the objective truth. It's just that is the emotional um, baggage, for lack of a better term. That is the identity that, that I brought to the film, that I projected onto the film. And as a result, yeah, that yeah, is... The, that is the basis of my anger, my hatred for it. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> yeah that, that's the thing. We we brought the, we brought our own perspective to the movie, and exactly. that's also the good thing with the movie because it actually made us brought these things and discuss them, and mm. and and we can. Uh, yeah, it is a good if the move if the <clears> purpose <throat> of the movie was to make us discuss it, then it is a extremely good movie. If the purpose yeah. was to make everybody a Buddhist, then it was a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh, oh, and, uh, Alex, just one thing to say about uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that, yes, I pan almost everything that comes within my field of vision, but uh, what Pingo was saying about discussing the film and coming to mm -hmm. understand each other, one of the reasons we are, st the ma perhaps the main reason we are still friends, even though I hate almost everything that you have ever <laughs> shown me, is that, yes, we do discuss things like this, and we do come away with an understanding of why we each like or dislike like what we do. Yeah. So, yeah. So that... <coughs> and I'm going to say, actually, um, this well, film... Do, do, James, oh, buy my record. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to, to, to round off this topic, I'll say, uh, this might be the most high-profile nomination of the entire night, and maybe part of the reason for its uh, success is that it's polarising, it's divisive, um, people have very disparate kind of feelings about it, and you get different perspectives, people feel different things um, by the end of it, which is quite an achievement for a, what, ten, uh, no, a five-minute um, animation. Oh, absolutely, yes. It, it, it's, one, it's one of those films in, of which no one will have a neutral opinion. Nobody will walk out of this film saying, "Yeah." Well, some people will walk out. Will well, some people will walk out saying, "Ooh, I wanted to touch everything. <laughs> <laughs> it just looked so soft." <laughs> Man, it's not even necessarily that it looks soft. Oh, it just looks uh, like it ever. An in yes, an interesting textscape. <laughs> also, finally, in the last few seconds, just to make it clear, the animation was absolutely amazing. Again, it's mm -hmm. the story and the message that I always look at first. It's, it's um, I think, from the artist's perspective, um, this was uh, some of the best animation um, that you could you could see, really. Absolutely, yes. It, 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 five stars for the animation, the story... Come on! Ah, okay. Uh, so I'll use the cliched expression um, last, but by no means least. Um, we have a very short short uh, from the. Is it Save the Children UK? Yes, uh, the charity is Save the Children, uh, the, the UK branch. Okay. Um, so, um, how does one describe this? Um, uh, one second representing. Um, a day in the life of uh, a Western child um, of a, apparently I'm not supposed to say first world anymore, a developed world child um, uh, who I think is presumably, yes, judging by the accent, British. Um, but what if is, is the story? What if her world became a war zone um, with the message at the end um, just because it doesn't happen here? doesn't mean that it doesn't happen um which yes you don't know what to expect when you uh, when you click on it uh i think shocking is a very simplistic very glib term but that, that you can only do so much in a title um is it thought provoking does it uh, evoke emotion is it important could it compel people into action uh instead of apathy i would argue uh yes um it's kind of something 
Uh, I, in a way, it's hard to review because it's something that you just have to see, and it's only a minute and a half of your life, so watch it. And um, going alphabetically again, uh, Koki, your thoughts on this video? Um, I guess what struck me, I guess it's more seeing it um, the second and third time, is that um, the first things that happen are actually pretty minor. The light goes out for a while. Um, mm. Occasionally they're evacuated from school. And these are kinds of things like um, there might be a school fire or the power outage. You know, it's still common daily life. And I suppose that's something that um, the transition from total peace to, you know, a war zone was what struck me the most. Because you don't instantly go into war mode. You know, mm. you hear about um, weapons. Someone was talking about something. I think that was the first instance that it brought up, like, a loaded weapon or something. And then occasionally there's a power outage. There might have been a fire thing in school or whatever. You're still living life. And I guess we don't really see that aspect of it. You know, the war is going on, and your life is made more inconvenient, but you're still living life as if there wasn't a war going on. Until... Mm. Finally, it was too late. It came crashing down. She's in a gas mask, um, you know, dirty and in like a refugee camp is what it looks like. I just really like that transition, I guess. Even as mm. quick as it was, because it is a very short film. But, you know, yeah. it, it has a high impact. Mostly because there are a lot of power outages here. So I'm thinking, yeah, even if war was going on, you know it wouldn't, like, sink in right away. Life would go on. Oh, definitely. And uh, how common they are here? I'd say not that common, and they tend not to last um, especially long, although obviously recently in the UK we've had some pretty uh, apocalyptic weather. Um, but, um, yeah, it kind of makes me think of um, when I was in Northern Ireland because there's so much that people got used to that when um, 9-11 came along and they were aware of people complaining about this and that and the other and why are there these restrictions when I get on a plane? Why are there... Uh, of course, if you'd lived through the troubles in Northern Ireland, you would take so much for granted that you actually kind of thought, oh, it's not like that everywhere. Um, and a friend of mine had, had lived in Northern Ireland in a time when um, to walk into a shop, you put your arms up to be searched. And for years afterwards, if you walked into a shop in Northern Ireland, like, say, Belfast, for example, you were still putting your hands in the air to be searched on reflex, because it's what you do when you enter a shop. And if you've taken that for granted, post 9-11, it was like, what are you people complaining about? Of course you go through all this stuff when you get on a plane and shit. What, well, how, how is this? What, Americans think this is strange? Americans are complaining? Um, but yeah, it's kind of like that. But then the whole perspective thing is, is a big part of um, of this as as well. And um, obviously, uh, it could happen here. It's maybe a little bit condescending because obviously, growing up in London, having to be a child on the London Underground back when you could suddenly be. Um, I actually even know the code now. Will Mister Sands please report to the operating room? Uh, means our IRA bomb uh, be on alert and so you would actually know right, okay, you might want to evacuate the station evacuate station, but you're not supposed to know that code because if, if everybody knew it, um, then there'd be a stampede and people would be trampled to death um, and you saw posters warning you about the sort of bombs and things um, and in a way it was like, um, as terrible as 9-11 was, I did harbour a slight resentment because I sort of thought apart from the fact that <clears throat> America funded the IRA. <clears throat> but um, it's quite... If you grew up in Western Europe during certain years, things like you and your mum could be blown up getting on a train, you kind of just had to accept that in London. Um, it was just kind of like a reality, like the Cold War was a reality. Like, if it's there all the time, you just kind of accept it. And this film is saying you're comparatively lucky, your children are comparatively lucky, compared with Syria, and it manages to do what it does. It punches you in the face with it. Um, 
and I'm going to pass it over to Pinge. After that is not much more to say because it, it's hap- the whole thing the movie does is that it take a crisis that we actually know about and they put it in in this case in Great Britain and yeah of course people will think oh shit this can actually happen to me and they it do it well and it it makes people think and it, it, it is an easy grip to do but it works I actually have nothing more to say about it, that movie, the, just the movie thing about it, then the political and blah blah blah, but then we have to have a two hour show and then we take that another time <laughs> mm. so it's effective and they do what it, what it should and hopefully people actually think when they, when they mm. look at it <laughs> Also, something you always get with one second a day films. Obviously, normally they're real. This one is is a, a staged and scripted thing. But what an actress that child is, because what they've captured, the, the most important thing, arguably, is not the background, it's the face, the changing face. Mm. There's one I've got mm. that I haven't dared watch yet, uh, yet for personal reasons, uh, which is uh, a second a day... Um, male victim of domestic abuse, uh, which I am going to watch, and I think that whole subject should be a topic at some point. <clears throat> but when it's a real one-second-a-day thing, you understand the changing of the face, the changing of the eyes, the changing even of the, of the complexion, the changing of the whole a- a character of the face, like the before and after pictures of soldiers, uh, before and after conflict, you know. Um, and that actor, that child actor, wow, because you actually, as if it were real, the eyes of that person at the end are not the eyes of the person at the beginning. Uh, that's something that that really that makes it real, basically. Um, <clears throat> uh, Queenie, your thoughts? Oh, you guys pretty much said everything that I would say. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to bring up the whole eyes thing, but then you stole it from me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the curse of the alphabet. It's the you had to begin with S. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, seriously. Beginning with the letter A, your name beginning with the letter A is a privilege you need to check regularly before saying, "Oh, we'll do it alphabetically." <laughs> oh, well, looky well, here, well, I check. happen to uh, come first. Uh, uh, I normally alternate between alphabet and reverse alphabet, but that's still unfair to people in the middle. I could, if you like, I could copy you, James, and I'll just become Wiley Alex. Or double or, or w, w Alex is that does that have the same <laughs> ring to it as you James? I I could be W Alex if that please. Although shall I just go I, get myself a drink? Am I going to be allowed to actually <laughs> give my opinion? Sorry. Well, Queenie didn't say much. Yeah. I know. Well, yeah, now that was... opens the floor for you, James, to say a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, James, your thoughts on uh, most shocking thirty seconds a day, uh, one second. You're having half an hour. <laughs> no. <laughs> When I mirrored this film myself on my own channel, I actually wanted to title it Now Imagine She's White, because that is the entire message of the film. Alex, having uh, raised raised money for Oxfam, knocking on doors, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the oh, they're sad, they're sand niggers, they're Muslims, they're terrorists. What do we care? Imagine she's white. So yes, as you say, a film. The film is a punch in the stomach. Uh, the skill of the actress uh, playing the girl in the story is it, it rivals that of the Korean actresses who can. Um, hold entire conversations with their eyes because yes uh at the in the final scene as she stares into the camera her mum saying make a wish darling you know what her wish is without Mm -hmm. even without a single word you you it's one of those things that just does not have to be said um also, what uh, Koki pointed out, the slow transition. If you watch it five, six, a dozen times, as I have, you notice things like the dad in the background reading the newspaper, the headline is UK, UK government declares martial law. 
Uh, right. The news in the background is talking about protesters being shot. Uh, the arguments with the neighbour is uh, all, all we hear is the neighbour as he jabs the dad in the chest saying, deserve to be shot. Um, again, we, I, I still believe that there will be a uh, unedited version mm. somewhere in the world that does show even more horror, that does show the girl's dad dying in a gas attack, because if you notice at the beginning, her whole family is there, and then at the end it's just her mother. And mm. it, so, yes, and again, 90 seconds, that's not, that's not enough for one second a day for a full year. So maybe they took liberties with it. May, but as I say, I do get the feeling that it was cut down to make it uh, more acceptable to a general audience. Either way, though, the the uh, film the, the filmmaking technique itself is flawless. It achieves mm. everything that it sets out to achieve in a in a very limited in a very limited format. Mm. It does show the build-up to war. Uh, the mm. dad saying they're staying in the house when it's when there's risk of attack. It does show um, that <laughs> the house without power, without water, you know, with uh, air raids going on outside, shelling going on outside. Uh, it mm. does show the school being blown up. It does show a gas attack. Finally, of course, being a charity video, the last 10, 20 uh, segments are taken up by uh, the girl receiving medical treatment in mm. what is obviously a Save the Children funded uh, a mm -hmm. refugee centre. But, st but still, again, that is the message of the book. That is the whole message of the video. All of these people you see suffering and dying in Syria... Now imagine they're white and hit the fucking donate button, you bastards. Uh, and again, yeah. I am, <laughs> I am channeling Bob Geldof when I say that. You know, don't go down the pub tonight, please. Just give us the fucking money. <laughs> um. So yes, I, I mean, uh, raising the subject of working for Oxfam, I didn't know how uh, full London was of racist fucks, to, uh, to be honest with you, uh, and definitely racist uh, privileged fucks, when you get people who won't, uh, they don't, even if you've disturbed them, they don't want you to come back. Um, I've had people, like, say come back, and then, like, hide. When, when someone's got two cars, and one of them's got a Jag, and one of them's got a Mercedes, and they don't even want to hear about somebody less fortunate than, than, uh, than themselves. Mm. Um, and to be honest, the experience of being an Oxfam fundraiser in London is because you have a folder that's got images and information and you, you have a folder to turn to and, and it's, and it's a, a, an important tool. Um, whenever the folder was changed, we would all share the same prayer. Please let there be some white people. Please. Just one picture of a white person in the whole thing. Which, obviously, there are parts of the world with poor white people, but... And, yeah, finding out just how many um, selfish, ethnocentric, and downright racist people there are in the greater London area... Um, a part of me died doing that job. <laughs> mm. um, okay, were there any other final um, thoughts regarding most shocking one second a day video? Uh, just the fact that uh, with regard to my votes, because of course uh, the point of the anti-Oscars is that we are going to vote on the winner from the five nominations, the best picture. Um mm the best short film, it is that unlike the Oscars, where people voted for 12 years as a slave, 
literally because it sounded cool, because it sounded progressive. Ooh, this will make the Academy look good. Uh, I have to resist the urge to vote for the most shocking uh, second a day video from Save the Children uh, because it is the most socially relevant, because I am channeling Bob Geldof. Just give us the <laughs> fucking money. You know, it's, imagine uh, that she's white. So that is my own personal issue, though. Yes, it is. Uh, Without a doubt, if the award was for the most important, the most socially relevant film, the most politically relevant film, hands down, uh, most shocking second of day video. But no, we are voting on the artistic merit of the film, the, the work in itself, not what it means. So, um, yes, and again, just... Uh, Yes, I completely understand, and actually, um, I'd even say that Miss Pepper, because I see mental health issues I can relate to, I have a slightly similar feeling, uh, and I'm going to, because uh, I'm the host, I can opt to go last, so the excitement is that I still haven't chosen to vote yet. <laughs> so, but alphabetically again, so obviously Koki is the one who nominated most shocking second a day video and hence cannot vote for well, it. So, just to uh, remind everyone though, uh, Schizophrenic Queen has dropped out, but we do have her vote. We do have a proxy vote, yes, and uh, Schizophrenic Queen sends her love to all the dear listeners of London After Midnight. <laughs> um, so, Koki Pirates... Uh, out of Voices, Miss Pepper, Russian Dolls, and The Maker, what is your vote? Well, uh, before this conversation, I was actually going to go with um, Russian Dolls, because it definitely had the most impact on me emotionally. But after seeing what The Makers did and how much you, you all got out of it and how much it caused you, James, to range, rage, <laughs> uh, you know, just seeing like the polarizing effect, I, I got to go with The Makers. Oh, wow. Okay. So, we have the maker, one vote. Rather. I don't know why I plural that, but yeah. Well, it kind of makes sense to, to call it um, to call it the makers, I suppose. Um, but, uh, okay then. And, uh, Pinke, your vote. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm decided, but I think I... It's going to be long, but not so long. Um, the... <laughs> The most shocking video is absolutely and it's effective and do everything it should. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Miss Pepper, I actually like it. It's fantastic. It, it also do what it should. Uh, but the maker does what it shouldn't do. It does wake questions, wake everything, and it's like, oh, I hate that you fucking thing. So it's if that was the purpose, that, then it is a fantastic movie, so I take The Maker. Aha, uh -huh, we have two for The Maker. Um, okay, so, you, James, 1978, have you reached a verdict? Yes, um, I'm going to go with... Uh, yes, I'm going to go with... Uh, la, la, la most shocking second-a-day film, not because of the political issues, but because of its art, sheer artistry, the skill of the cinematography, the skill of the editing, the skill of the actress who has an amazing career ahead of her. So, mm. yes. Wow. So, so far, um, I'll mention Queenie's uh, proxy vote for uh, Miss Pepper. Um, we have two for the maker, putting it in the lead. One for uh, for most shocking. Ah, now <laughs> I have, as I said, oh, see, they're both emotional bias. Um, obviously, the maker I have a huge appreciation for. Um, it's it it's tricky. Um, but is this going to end um, in a tie? Is this going to end in a... Oh, well, the only... Well, actually... Oh, yes, it you, could be, There are two possible it? bolts that could cause it to end in a tie. Oh, that's... And if, if uh, it's the tie, then I'll have the deciding vote. 
Uh, if it's a tie, uh, we'll have to throw it to the audience and announce the winner next week. Oh, no. Okay, bastard. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was so looking forward to a tie <laughs> and having the power. The power. Uh, James needs yes. the power now. Ah. <laughs> oh. See, Miss Pepper and Most Shocking Second of Day video are each equally powerful in different ways. Um, uh, I think the fact that I had to do the, the, the job of an Oxfam fundraiser for so long, uh, but that is, that is technically voting about the issue. Yes. But it does also explain why it struck a chord with me even more than the mental health aspects that I related to of Miss Pepper. Yes. Um, and it did it in 90 seconds. So uh, we have uh, then uh, two votes for most shocking one second a day video, which means we do have a tie situation. So the anti-Oscars, ladies and gentlemen has no winner until uh well, yeah we're based I'm basically begging anybody listening to please please <laughs> vote because we have a t- um I think how should we do this a general vote from the five or to vote between the two tied films uh again uh we've already established that uh people well it, it's not a five there's four of us now we're down to four. And, um, oh, sorry, excuse me, I've, I've lost. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, that a, a vote between the two tied films rather than it just being completely open. Has... Okay, so, uh, obviously the films are all linked in the description. Um, <clears throat> if anybody uh, listening, uh, between The Maker and... Most shocking second a day video. If you could cast your votes in the comment section, and um, that the winner will be announced at the beginning of the next London After Midnight, which, by the way, is planned to be a madness and mayhem special, for which I'm hoping to get Queenie back because she will be a contributor to Madness and Mayhem the following week. Yeah. Uh, I, <clears throat> I will also be linking uh, the HIV and AIDS charity, of course as well as the event. And if we could have inspiring words of goodbye from Koki. The hamster of prosperity smiles upon this anti-Oscar, and may the hamster of prosperity rest upon your heads. And equally inspiring words, I hope, from Pingay Music. Yeah, as always, have a skillful life. <laughs> have a skillful life, of course. And, and of course, your debut... Um, performance, your de- debut appearance, and uh, of course, I forgot, of course, have a skillful life. Binge has a catchphrase and inspiring words of goodbye from none other than you, mm. James 1978. If I'd been able to vote for Miss Pepper, the chances are that it would have won. Damn, <laughs> as I imposed upon myself. Yo, uh, if I could vote for a um, minute video, it would have won, but yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, right, James, it was it is a good <clears throat> video, but I I have to choose. <laughs> yeah, I know. And again, that's always the problem. Don't make me choose. No. Uh, <laughs> um and uh what a terrible feeling. There was something I forgot to say, and I I it's, it's gone from my head. So um well. A big, a, sorry, a big round of applause for all the non-academy people. <laughs> what? Who said what? That made sense. Oh, I think Piggy said. I said what? It was a cheer. Oh, yeah. Woo! Oh, woot! Sorry, I thought you said what? <laughs> woot! Absolutely, I think. Uh, and so, good night, YouTube. Good night, everyone. <laughs>